I'm Brian. I'm one of the co-founders here at Bristle, who works with our provider partners. And today we're going to be discussing the mysteries of the oral microbiome and how comprehensive microbiome testing can give us new insights and new understanding of the microbiome. So we're going to do a quick recap on what is the oral microbiome, a very brief recap because I'm sure you all are experts, but then we'll get into community balance, symbiosis and dysbiosis, which is a key concept for us at Bristle. I'll then give a quick introduction into the Bristle comprehensive oral microbiome test and then get into what are some of those novel microbiome insights and advantages of comprehensive microbiome profiling. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. But feel free to put them in chat if you have questions at any time. So to start, what is the oral microbiome? So this is not the oral microbiome pictured. Um, this is a garden, as you can all tell. But it does actually form a pretty great analogy um, as to how we should really be thinking about the microbiome and how our understanding of the microbiome has evolved. So as we go through the presentation and we're discussing the ins and outs of the microbial community, try to think of a garden. And I'll have a callback to this analogy later in the presentation. But the oral microbiome is the root of all oral health and disease. So there's over 800 unique bacterial and fungal species that make up the oral microbiome. And decades of scientific literature has shown that when we have an overabundance of certain pathogenic microbes or when the community falls out of balance is when we see a shift towards different types of disease. But that by early detection and management of these imbalances, we can mitigate disease progression and really set our patients up for longer term health. And so when the microbiome is healthy, uh, it'll look like we see on the left. So in a state of symbiosis or homeostasis, where the community is a diverse makeup of different microbes, largely commensal or beneficial bacteria, but in a stable and healthy state, uh, actually performing a lot of important functions for our health. But when the environment changes, so through diet, medication, mouth breathing, lack of proper hygiene, we see this shift instead towards dysbiosis, which we see on the right which allows the community to become pathogen dominant and start to lead towards disease. And so a key concept when we're thinking about the microbiome is this notion of balance over bad apples. So rather than just honing in on pathogens, making sure we're understanding the full community balance of the microbiome. And this is a picture of what ChatGPT thinks a healthy, balanced uh, microbiome looks like. So good vibes all around. And this is how that presents in the oral cavity. So contrary to, I think, historic belief, uh, we actually do want low levels of pathogens or traditional pathogens in the oral microbiome. They seem to actually train the immune system and help keep the community stable. So rather than trying to eradicate all of these pathogens, we now know that they make up a part of a healthy microbiome. And in addition, we have a large abundance of beneficial bacteria that actually promote health via pH balancing, remineralizing teeth, further training the immune system, and then actively suppressing pathogens in their activity. And it's really when we don't have both of these that this community can shift into a state of dysbiosis. And this is where we're seeing here that a lack of beneficial bacteria is allowing for pathogenic overgrowth and invasion. And this is where we'll start to see high levels of inflammation or high levels of acid production. And what we know is that these dysbiotic communities require intervention and treatment to return to homeostasis. They're not able to do it on their own. And that's where all of you and us come in. But the other key thing to note here is that there are dozens of pathogenic species involved in the oral microbiome and disease. And a key characteristic of oral disease is that these are often cross-species interactions, meaning that in certain species, they may actually be fine on their own and actually may perform important functions in a healthy microbiome. But when another pathogen is present, they seem to change the behavior of these species. 
and they don't play nice together, which can actually start to lead them to becoming pathogenic and leading towards disease. So another key concept here is that disease isn't just caused by one species alone, but rather as a community and as how these different species are actually interacting with one another. So when we think about the different methods of profiling the oral microbiome, there's a few different ones that are used today. Most commonly, there is a technique, it's called qPCR. And qPCR uh, is the traditional standard approach, which is great at measuring a handful of targets. So basically predefined targets that we're interested in measuring the quantity of. But with Bristle, we wanted to take a different tact. So we wanted to make sure that we could profile the complete community of bacteria and fungi from that single saliva sample. So we use a technology, which we see on the far left, called shotgun metagenomics. And what this allows us to do is profile the quantity and um, identify every single species in the oral microbiome. And we can also read the genes of each species. So we can actually start to identify what these bacteria might be doing. And I'll call back to how we incorporate that into our scoring and what that allows us to do later in the presentation. And I'm sure when you're hearing that we're measuring every bacteria that it might seem that it's gonna be overwhelming. Um, and in fact, it can be, if we're just looking at a list of hundreds of species. So the other thing that we've developed and that's been developed is that we're able to um, distill this comprehensive microbiome data into simplified zero to 10 health scores for different conditions. These scores represent a summary of the composition of the community. So measuring the abundance of pathogens related to each condition, but also measuring some of those cross-species interactions and doing a lot of that work for you so there's not as much interpretation on your end and on your patient's end. And that's what led us to developing the Bristle Oral Health Test. So the Bristle test, it's the first test to measure all 800 plus bacteria and fungi from a single saliva sample. And the reason we do that is we wanna be able to give you deep oral and systemic health insights into different conditions. So tooth decay and gum inflammation, but beyond. We'll also give you the full breakdown of all species detected and help indicate if they're more pathogenic or beneficial species. And lastly, we try to close the loop. So we'll actually give you personalized in-office oral care and diet recommendations based on test results that you can use to help personalize your care with your patients. So the way it works is very simple. Basically, we'll have a collection tube and a funnel, and you'll just collect one milliliter of saliva from a patient at the beginning of the appointment. It then gets sent back to our lab with a prepaid mailing envelope, and results are returned to you in about two to three weeks. Very simple, spit, shake, ship, as we generally say. So now going to switch gears a bit and get into what are some of those advantages of comprehensive testing and what are some of those insights you can really glean from this type of testing. So the first is that we can get a more accurate assessment of a patient's health by getting a deeper understanding of that community balance. And for this, we're actually gonna use a fun example. So what we're going to do, calling back to the garden, is try to assess the health of two gardens below. So we have garden A and garden B, and we're gonna reveal different data about them and then try to infer which of these gardens seems to be in a healthier and more stable state. So the first data point we'll get is that each garden has seven weeds in it. So when we look at both of these gardens, it can be difficult to then know which garden here is actually at a higher risk of weeds infestation. Because at first glance, if we just know those weeds or those pathogens, it would appear that both of them seem to be at a pretty similar risk of these weeds taking over the rest of their garden. But if we get a new data point where we can actually measure the total number of plants present in their makeup, you can see we get a very different picture of these two gardens. And as we can see, garden B, despite having those same number of weeds, actually appears to be in a much more stable state. It's gonna be much more difficult for 
these weeds from uh, these weeds to take over the rest of the community because there's mushrooms and shrubs and other things actually taking that place and protecting the garden from that from being overrun. Versus if we look at garden A, there's no real protection here. And so we'd assume that this garden is probably going to be weed infested very soon. But we do something similar today when we look at traditional saliva testing. So similarly, we can look at these two patients where we're measuring the quantity of bacteria related to periodontal disease and caries. And again, when we look at these two patients side by side, the takeaway might be that they're actually in pretty similar states of health or risk for disease. But when we get that complete community picture, we can see that again, it's a very different level of health where patient A, despite having that same abundance of bacteria, those are really only making up 20% of their microbiome because they have a very healthy abundance of beneficial bacteria. Versus in patient B, that abundance actually represents a much higher proportion of their microbiome. So we would assume that patient B is actually at a much more increased risk for disease. And we now know that they are. The second key advantage with comprehensive testing is actually being able to go deeper and ensure that we're getting the complete picture when we're looking at each condition. So here are a few studies. Um, it's been a while since 1998 when Dr. Sokransky popular, popularized the red and orange complex species. And you know, with new technologies like what we're leveraging at Bristol, we've been able to discover, and the research community at large uh, has discovered novel bacteria and microbes and their role in dental caries and periodontal disease. You know, I think traditionally we used to think of strep mutans when we think of caries, but we now know it goes far beyond that. And what that translates to is that if we're using testing that is traditionally focused on those original microbes, when we look at a list of all of the species that are now known to be involved in gum inflammation, we're actually not getting the complete picture. And we can see that we're missing quite a few species that could be contributing to patient's disease. And this picture becomes even more stark when we look at tooth decay and we see that there's quite a large number of species that are now known to be cariogenic or actually leading towards tooth decay that aren't traditionally captured by other tests. And this has real implications when we start thinking about testing patients because we know that there will be patients who have these bacteria driving their conditions that we may otherwise clear because we don't see those species present. And I did see a question about, is there a PDF of these slides? Um, that will be sent as well. So we can send that as well. But I actually want to highlight a case of where this came into play with a patient at Bristol. So this patient was a 40 year old male he was extremely meticulous with his dental hygiene. He was brushing three times a day, flossing three times a day, water picking nightly, actually ch changed around his entire diet to try and boost his oral health. And despite this, still was experiencing episodic periodontal abscesses, severe bleeding, um, areas with 50% bone loss, and seemingly monthly having these complaints of water blisters that would pop and ooze um, from around his mouth. So his dentist wisely uh, took a salivary test. So you can see the results here. They took a salivary test that looked at traditional periodontal pathogens using PCR, but it all came back negative. So we still didn't know what was driving these symptoms. And over the course of four years, that patient then ended up seeing four different periodontal specialists taking antibiotics, taking antimicrobials, but nothing seemed to resolve the symptoms. So then thankfully the dentist got in touch with us at Bristol and here are the results from that patient's first test. And as you can see, once again, we're not seeing very high scores on some of those different conditions, but one of the things that jumped out to us was the diversity score here, which is measuring the number of different species and the abundance of different species across the community. So to see a zero there meant there's not a lot of diversity. So something was going on. So we dug in deeper and we found a single species, Serratia marsicans, that made up over 78% 
of the patient's microbiome, which was something we hadn't seen before. And serratia, for background, isn't typically found in the oral microbiome. It's actually typically found in tile grout. So this was very interesting. And so we thought perhaps this could be the reason behind the issues. So we dug in deeper. And in reviewing the literature, we found that xylitol actually seemed to inhibit the growth of serratia marsicans from different studies. So then with the patient and his care team, we took a different tact to how we were approaching his symptoms. So here's the timeline of his treatment and his symptoms over the course of about a year and a half. And you can see that at the get-go when we were using chlorhexidine and antimicrobials, we didn't see any real progress or improvements in the patient's symptoms. But then in June of 2022, we switched to using xylitol mints three times a day and incorporating a lactobacillus ruteri probiotic twice a day. And then over the course of about six months, we saw that the patient went from having one periodontal abscess a month to actually complete resolution of their symptoms. And I think more excitingly, not only did we see the reduction in the gum inflammation score um, or in that abundance of the serratia marsicans bacteria, but if we look at this blue line, we see that that patients' diligent hygiene, diet, habits were now yielding their fruit because we actually saw that the microbiome was shifting towards being commensally dominant. So this was a great sign that we weren't just reducing the levels of the harmful species, but actually replacing it with these commensal species, setting the patient up for more stable, longer-term health. So a third advantage of comprehensive microbiome testing is that we can expand our insights beyond tooth decay and gum inflammation and into things like halitosis, gut health, nitric oxide production, and more. So starting with halitosis, we know that there are dozens of species that can contribute to halitosis symptoms. There's certain microbes in the oral cavity that digest amino acids and different byproducts of our food and release volatile sulfur compounds and other malodorous compounds that actually lead to bad breath. And something that's been interesting is in studying bad breath, because we've had a lot of patients come to us with bad breath, we found that these bacteria can reside in different niches, which actually necessitates different treatment modalities. So we call these the six different types of halitosis that we've identified, and you can see them listed here. So some people with bad breath will be getting it from the gum line, either from inflammatory or non-inflammatory species. Others will be more fungal in nature. Um, some like, excuse me, yours truly, um, have a tongue coating bacteria type. This is actually a screenshot from my bristle report, which means that for me, if I'm experiencing halitosis, it's more likely than not coming from the bacteria on my tongue. So I could be flossing all day and actually not be addressing the root cause of my problem. So now I don't leave home without my tongue scraper. I tongue scrape twice a day because um, I know that that's where my susceptibility would be. And one of the places where the oral and systemic connection is most apparent is when we look at the relationship of oral health and gut health. So People with IBD, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and other inflammatory conditions are actually two times more likely to have periodontitis. And this may be due to two different um, hypotheses. So the first is actually direct colonization. So this is where oral bacteria may actually translocate to the gut and colonize, leading to inflammation. And Klebsiella and Enterobacter are a couple of these species that have been implicated in studies. But another factor is actually immune training. So when we have uh, inflammation in the oral cavity, we tend to recruit Th17 immune cells that then travel between the colon and the mouth, regulating inflammation at both sites. And then when we see that further translocation of these bacteria, this may exacerbate that inflammation, continuing to worsen or exacerbate gut issues. Another area where we know this connection is particularly strong is with colorectal cancer. So Fusobacterium nucleatum has been enriched in colorectal cancer tumors. And when studied, they found that high intertumor FN loads are actually associated with recurrence, metastasis, and poorer patient prognosis. 
And it's worth noting that FN is actually quite common in healthy people. We find it in about 96% of people's microbiomes. And it's normally insufficient to cause disease. But again, when we start to think about FN, normally a healthy, microbi healthy member of our microbiome, when disease becomes present, when we get cuts in our gums, when systems are inflamed, that's when we can start to see it move around the body and actually start to cause problems. So one of the insights we give with the bristle test is a gut impact score. And you can leverage this score to get insight into how oral microbes may actually be affecting a patient's gut health. So if you have patients who are having chronic unresolved gut issues, it could be helpful to take a bristle test because a high score may indicate that some of those issues may actually be originating from the mouth or be getting exacerbated by these bacteria in the mouth. So if we're just treating the gut, we're not actually addressing the full scale of the digestive tract and may actually be missing a key component of what's actually driving their symptoms. Another key area where our oral bacteria can impact our overall health is with nitric oxide production. So nitric oxide is critically important to our vascular health, to our neural health and our cardiovascular health. And I think oral bacteria are one of the unsung heroes of nitric oxide production. So there are specific communities in the oral cavity that actually convert nitrate and its precursors into nitric oxide. And this pathway is actually polymicrobial. So it involves a number of different species from within the oral cavity. And so what we developed at Bristol is by looking at the genes of these different species, um, since we have that full resolution from our shotgun metagenomics technique, we were able to actually identify what the patient's capacity is to convert nitrate into nitric oxide. So if you have a patient who's trying to do work on their nitric oxide, so if they're doing myofunctional therapy or um, other techniques and are very interested in their heart and brain health, this is again another key insight to really get them engaged and motivated about their oral health and see how we can try to boost the levels of those beneficial bacteria to really hit a multifaceted approach at boosting nitric oxide. Another thing we can do is, and a feature you'd find in the Bristle report, is actually getting better visualization of some of these oral and systemic associations. So what you're seeing here is our oral systemic associations table, where in each report, we'll actually show you that patient's abundance of these pathogens that are more commonly associated with systemic health conditions. So we can actually pinpoint which of these bacteria they have, do we see them at a high, moderate, or low abundance? And then actually be able to share with patients what those have been connected to. So have these species been associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease? Again, not to scare patients, but I think to try and make it a little more real when we talk about these connections and the importance of getting these microbes under control in the oral cavity and showing those associations that what's actually taking place in their oral cavity, which species they have, and how that could be impacting their overall health. So the last key advantage with comprehensive testing is that we can start to get more streamlined treatment planning via in-depth recommendations and start to tailor and personalize care a bit further. So I've shown these scores throughout the presentation, but the other thing we include with each score is a full breakdown of the bacteria we found related to that score. So here's just a quick snapshot of a few of the bacteria we found related to gum inflammation in this patient's results. And what you'll see is that we'll also give you more information and characteristics about this species. Is it gram negative or gram positive? Are they largely anaerobes? Are we seeing aerobic or facultative microbes? And lastly, we'll indicate if they've been sensitive to any particular probiotic strain when we dug into the literature. So for this patient, we can see that they are predominantly anaerobic driven, which makes sense when we're looking at gum disease, but that their species are actually lactobacillus ruteri sensitive. So when we start to think about what types of interventions may work best for this patient, we may actually want to consider a probiotic that contains lactobacillus ruteri versus some other different options that might be out there. The other thing we'll do is as a practitioner, 
you'll receive treatment suggestions um, based on your patient's results. So this is never patient facing. They won't see this. This is really just a resource for you where what we'll ask you to do is actually pick the patient's gum health status, which you see up here. And then what the algorithm will do is factor that information in with the scores and provide suggestions of when we might consider different types of adjunctive interventions. So in this example we're looking at, this patient was healthy, perhaps a new patient, but we actually see they have a high abundance of gum inflammation bacteria. So this may actually be a great opportunity to try and intervene and actually practice preventative dentistry and get those bacteria under control before they start to lead to irreversible damage. And so in this case, what the report is recommending is we may want to consider something like PerioProtect um, or other types of adjunctive care that you have in your practice to try and get those levels under control. And these recommendations will change depending on the gum health status. So here we can see that the patient now was characterized with periodontitis. And because we see periodontitis and those very high levels of gum inflammation bacteria, this is where if you use antibiotics, we'd say maybe this is where you'd consider it. Um, you know, always trying to practice good stewardship there to not overuse antibiotics, but let you know when they might be necessary or effective. But in addition, trying to call out other types of approaches that might be appropriate here, like SRP or laser, again, different types of options that you might have available at your practice. And for each of these recommendations, if you click on it, we'll give you more information about it. So we'll give you a description of it. We'll explain that mechanism of what the, um, of how that intervention works and impacts the microbiome. And then we'll also link out to supporting scientific research and evidence. So if you want to do more digging on your own, or if you want to have at your fingertips, some links very easy to share with your patients, if they want to dig deeper, we try to take a lot of that work out for you and try to make that very easy. But we know that in-office care is really just one piece of the equation. You can set your patients up for optimal success, but at the end of the day, it really takes a combination of in-office care as well as at-home care to really get them on the right track. So within each report, we'll also include a goal and a care plan for at-home care. So here we can see that in this example, the goal was to reduce gum inflammation bacteria. And you can see down below, we've actually generated a regimen of different interventions that we recommend for this patient. And similarly, if you or the patient wants to dig deeper and see any information about any of these recommendations, you can click on them and it'll take you to a description here where we'll explain why you might want to consider that intervention and what it actually can do to the oral microbiome. So really, where does it fit into your oral health regimen. And you'll see that we have products here. These are really just products that we vetted or our um, advisory board has vetted to have clean ingredients and try to avoid unnecessary additives and things. We don't have relationships with these companies. So um, really our goal is to give you ingredient level recommendations and let you and your patients figure out what's gonna work best for them. And we also try to get into some other guidance. So along with products and oral care recommendations, we can also give you access to dietary recommendations. So here is a snapshot from our at-home care guide, which you can access from inside the Bristle portal, where we'll try to get into dietary guidance as well. So in this case, if we see someone with moderate or high tooth decay, increasing their vitamin D through diet or actually increasing arginine through interventions like poultry, lentils, soybeans, can be really great and effective approaches that patients can use to try and reduce their risk of decay. And on the flip side, if we saw a patient with high gum inflammation, that's where we may want to look for foods high in nitrate to try to feed those nitric, nitric oxide producing bacteria and possibly even omega-3s, you know, really trying to bolster our immune system and give our system what it needs to combat these conditions. And one of the exciting things is we survey Bristle patients um, and Bristle users after they've gone through the experience. And over 80% um, of users report that they've adopted our care recommendations. So whether it's starting to floss again or actually going much more in depth, incorporating a probiotic or making dietary interventions. I think this has been one of the most exciting things for us since starting Bristle is seeing that 
when patients receive a report in this a report in this format, it tends to resonate a bit deeper and can actually be very motivating to not just be trying to knock down pathogens, but build up their beneficial bacteria to really set them up for longer term health. So in terms of pricing, the um, here you can see our practitioner pricing. It's generally on a pay as you go model where you can order test kits to have in your practice um, and where you're just paying for $15 per kit up front with the remaining fees for labs and processing taking place at the end of each month. So basically when you're first getting started, you can start testing for about $120 total. So $15 for the kits and materials up front and then 105 at the end of the month after you've sent it back to our lab. So total cost with shipping and everything is about 90 to $120. And generally what our practices will price this back to patients at is anywhere from 150 to $300, depending on the level of consult um, you'll be giving them. And we leave that up to you because we want it to be what makes sense for your pay practice. The other thing I want to call out is that we love doing trainings and supporting you every step of the way. So when you get your first few patient samples, we love to set up one-on-one -on -one trainings, go through those results together, and you'll always have access to us for patient reviews, for ongoing phone and email support. And the last thing is that we really try to act on feedback. There's a few people on the call here who have given us some incredible feedback that we've already incorporated into the report. and are going to keep working on. So please keep the feedback coming because it's really through our partnership with innovative practitioners like you that we can get to that future of oral health that we're really hoping for. And that actually concludes the presentation. So I wanted to thank you all for attending. Um, I have a couple emails here that I'll leave up in case you want to get in touch with us. So that's my email, brian at Bristol Health. And we also have provider support at bristlehealth.com, which goes to our whole provider support team in case you want to get in touch and are interested in starting testing or have any questions when you're first getting started. Awesome. And now we can actually move on to questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I also have some questions that people had submitted before. So if no questions, I can start to tackle those too. So Lee, I see your question. Are the Bristol results and reports different when done in the dental office versus if, if a patient is do, does at home? Um, the patient facing aspect of the report won't be different. So patients, if you give them access to the report, so you have full control on if they can see the report, um, they will see the scores and then the at-home care recommendations. Only if you test in office and if it's actually done through a practitioner will you get that added granularity of in-office care and suggestions and have access to some of those deeper in, uh, product and diet recommendations. Stephen, thank you so much. Really appreciate the feedback. Um, how long do the probiotics last in the mouth after one use? So this is a great question. It's a bit um, contrary to popular belief, probiotics generally aren't there to try and be reintroduced as a species to the microbiome community. It's actually pretty difficult to introduce a species into the community. The community tends to develop and likes to stay that way. But one of the key advantages of probiotics is that they actually release molecules called bacteriosins that seem to inhibit the growth of certain pathogens and actually promote the growth of certain commensal species. And I see your note that strep salivaris K12 lasts eight days. So we haven't actually done that testing internally at Bristol. I think that's, uh, if you share the paper, I would love to read it. Linda, what is your opinion of biobotanical dental products such as dental sidin, toothpaste, et cetera? So, we're huge fans of anyone who's bringing innovative products into the space. Um, we're actually going to be presenting at Biocidens Oral Health Summit right now, and we're actually running uh, some studies with them currently. So we'll be really excited to share some more of those details as they come out. But um, early signs look really promising and really exciting. So hopefully more to come on that front. 
And definitely, if you're interested, check out the Biocide and Oral Health Summit. We posted about it on our Instagram and sent out an email. So maybe you saw it. If you are interested in learning more, I definitely recommend checking that out. Cool. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I can jump over to some of the questions we received before the presentation. So one of them was, is salivary testing effective at detecting bacteria within periodontal pockets? So this is actually an internal study we've been running recently, and we should have the results out shortly. But early data suggests that we actually do a good job of, basically, we were comparing paper points to broad microbiome saliva testing. And what we found is that we were able to pick up all of the same species that were detected from the periodontal pockets in that saliva test. Obviously, within the pocket, there are much higher concentrations. But I think one of the interesting things is that not only did we find the pathogens from that pocket, is we actually found other species that are implicated in periodontal disease that also were detected in the saliva sample, which may indicate that although that pocket may be the primary area of interest, that there might be other species or other sites that we may want to take a look at. Um, you know, one of the interesting things we keep developing or learning about the oral microbiome. There was a question of if testing is available in other countries. So unfortunately, at this time, bristle testing is only available in the United States and Canada. We'd love to expand at some point. So definitely stay tuned if you are located in another country, but currently just in the US and Canada. And let's see, there's another question. There was a question about insurance covering. So generally insurance won't cover the test. There are codes uh, available regarding salivary testing, but generally we recommend, um, or generally we advise that insurance won't be reimbursing. Um, but generally we do see HSA and FSA plans. So if your patients do have an HSA or an FSA plan, it's definitely worth them looking into to see if they might be able to get those covered through their care provider. Excellent. Um, were there any other questions while we're all here? Christy said, this is fascinating. I'm a dental hygienist, gardener, and unfortunately a homeowner going through testing for mold remediation. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm learning a lot about qPCR testing and imbalanced systems. Yes, I'm sorry you have to learn via that method. Um, but yes, I think as a gardener, you'd have a really great appreciation for how much work goes into keeping that garden stable um, and you know the role that keeping that balance and keeping that abundance of those commensal species really plays in our health. Okay, um, I'll give it one more minute in case anyone has any other questions. Awesome. Thank you, Heidi. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for joining. As a reminder, my email is brian at bristlehealth.com. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're so honored and excited to be working with you all and your patients in improving oral care. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you all again for making time on your Wednesday evening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.